Well, good morning, Calvary Church. My name is Tucker Anderson. I'm the Roseville campus pastor here, and it's good to be gathered together today to worship. Those of you joining us online, we're glad you've chosen to join us today. And if you're a guest online, if you're a guest in this room, we especially welcome you, and we'd love to meet you at our Welcome Center after the service today. Over the course of this month, Pastor Sean has been unpacking our new vision statement, believing God for greater things in the next five years. And as part of our vision statement, we want to see a greater reliance upon God as a church, as individuals, relying on God that he's going to do these greater things in our lives and in our community. One of my former pastors at another church uh, said that prayerlessness is a declaration of our independence from God. And as part of this vision of wanting to rely on God more deeply, we want to be committed to prayer and praying for our community. So I really want to encourage you to sign up for this 21 Days of Prayer prayer walk around our community at the end of the service today. I invite you to check out the Welcome Center where we have more information. You can pick up one of these cards that explains more about this 21 Days of Prayer initiative. Over the course of this summer, I've been leading a group of people through the book of Hebrews on Thursday nights, and some of you are, are sitting here in this room. This past week, we came across a passage in Hebrews chapter 12, the very, uh, towards the end of the book. And Hebrews 12:18 uh, says this. You have not come to what could be touched, to a blazing fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words, those who heard it begged that no other, uh, not another word might be spoken, for they could not bear what was commanded. And that was this. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The appearance was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Instead, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels, a festive gathering to the assembly of the firstborn whose names have been written in heaven, to a judge who is God of all, to the spirits of righteous people made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which says better things than the blood of Abel. In this passage, we see the terrifying glory of the Lord in the beginning, but we see at the very end that because of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, even today, we're invited to boldly come before God's presence. Let's stand as we worship together this morning. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and, and extol him with music and song. Blessed be the name, blessed 
Never forget his many blessings. He forgives all my sins. He touches my afflictions with healing. He snatches me back from the gaping jaws of hell. He covers me with concern and love. He fulfills my deepest desires and gives me meaning for life and purpose for living. God is a God of judgment and justice but he sides with those who need his help. He is angry with those who persistently rebel against him, but he pours out his love on those who turn to him. He does not give us our just desserts or pay us what we well deserve. He is grieved when we so miserably fail, but he quickly draws us to his forgiving heart and accepts us just as if it had never happened. He looks with tenderness at his faltering children. He knows and understands our fallible natures. God's human creatures are pitiful pictures of weakness. Now and then, one will, like a streaking meteor, blaze out across the skies of time only to become a smoking cinder at the end of the short journey. But those who are joined to God's loving will and purposes become the objects of his eternal mercy and righteousness. Rejoice with me, you who are his invisible servants, and you who hear and obey his voice. Shout his praises, you who are his children, and you who serve as his ministers and priests. There is no time for despair and discouragement. Whoever and wherever you are, lift your hearts in praise to God.
mine in prayer. We praise you, O Lord, for you alone are worthy of praise. Your greatness is unmatched. Your power and glory, your love and compassion go beyond our understanding, but we are so grateful for the way you love us and care for us. You, Lord God, are the exalted head. You rule over all things. And we praise you as the giver of life and joy, the giver of hope and salvation, the giver of strength and wisdom. We pray that as your body gathered here at Calvary, that our hearts and minds would be united as one to lift you up and glorify you and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to all those we may encounter. Father, we do want to pray this morning in a very special way for all those in the past few weeks who have experienced the homegoing of a loved one, who are grieving that loss. We ask you, Lord, to comfort them, to fill them with your peace and a sense of your presence. Lord, we pray, too, for our communities, for our neighbors. Lord, we pray that we might be the feet and the hands and the eyes and the arms of, of Jesus in their lives as we care for them, as we demonstrate your love for them. And we pray, Father, that our, our mercy and grace towards them would be a way in which they would come to know Jesus Christ and experience his love in a special way. Father, we want to thank you for the incredible camping ministry at Trout Lake Camp. For all the campers that have gone there, Lord, who have been touched by your spirit, who have come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. We pray for John and James and Tate and the whole staff as they continue to carry on this ministry. And we pray, God, that you will continue to bless them in the work that they are doing. Father, we want to lift up our Christian colleges and students and thank you for those who teach so faithfully there. We thank you in a special way for Bethel and Northwestern. And we pray, Lord, that as they prepare to begin another year of educating young men and women in the good news and in the gospel and in the word of Jesus Christ, that they would be prepared for that experience and that they would grow deeply in their faith. We pray that you would give those who lead those schools the, the strength and the wisdom that they need to carry on in a successful way. Father, we also want to pray for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. Lord, it seems like this conflict is endless. It continues on. And we don't want to forget them, Lord. We want to be engaged in praying for them and asking for your spirit to minister to them. We thank you, Lord, for the generosity that's been exhibited already and poured out towards our brothers and sisters there. And we do pray that you would bring that war to an end, that you would enable all who are in that nation to return to some semblance of normalcy and continue to carry on. And we pray that through this, many would come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We ask you, Father, to uh, give us each the wisdom, the grace, and the mercy that we need to be fully devoted servants of yours. And we pray, Father, for the need that we've experienced here in our own church for people to step up and volunteer in different ways. And as we make that emphasis this month, I pray, Lord, that if you're stirring in someone's heart, that they would respond. I thank you, God, for those who do serve, who are so faithful of giving of their time and their talents and their spiritual gifts. And we pray that that would be true for all of us. Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. You are the one true living God. Our sense of hope and purpose and vision comes from you. So we pray all this in the powerful and precious name of Jesus. Amen.
Well, good morning and welcome. Uh, if you're a guest here, I want to especially thank you for coming. And you're here at a really good time because um, what we're unpacking in the month of August, kind of the things that are really, really important to us here at Calvary Church and kind of the stuff that, you know, this is like welcome to uh, the kitchen. This is how the sauce is made uh, kind of conversations. And we want to get to that stuff. And we're, we're jumping around a couple different passages of Scripture. Um, but, but what we're doing is saying, hey, we're going we're gonna to come under the Word of God. We're going to submit our lives to what it teaches us. Um, that this isn't just something that we dreamed up on our own, but saying, hey, what is, what is God's heart? Um, we, we entered a season probably a year ago, and you know, we've been kind of walking through it, maybe even the last 20 years, where, where we just kind of go back and say, you know, in conversations with each other and conversations with God, what is it that God wants? What is it that will honor God? What is it that God has called us to in this space, in this time, in this place, in the setting that we find ourselves as a church, what does it mean to be a church today? And a church not only for the people that are here, but a church for the people who are not here yet, and, and a desire to do that really well as, as a community. And so what we're jumping into some things where we're backing up and saying, um, you know, what, what is our mission statement? So our mission statement is this uh, rock solid part saying, hey, here's the desti- destination. And so we've said our, our mission statement is to honor God by building relationships, and seeing Jesus transform lives. That's been kind of the, the bedrock of what we built everything out of because we feel it's strongly biblical, it's God-centered. It is saying that relationships matter, but it is Christ who does the transforming work. And this, this work of Christ we, we hold on to because God does incredible things, and we hear these stories, and we love to tell those. But out of that mission statement, we said, um, how are we going to do this? And we're calling that our vision or our marching orders. This is how we get to that. And we landed in John 14, 12, where Jesus, speaking to his disciples, said, um, here's just a little FYI, very truly I tell you, he said, you will do the works that I've been doing and you'll do even greater things because I'm going to the Father. So he's saying basically like, I'm, I'm not going to be here. Um, you've seen me, you've walked with me, you, you are believing in Jesus, that, that's a faith statement, and that's the prerequisite, but he said, you're going to do the works that I'm doing, and you're going to do even greater things, because I'm going to my Father. Now, the disciples have a history of kind of getting it wrong. <laughs> they, you know, we have to be really cautious about greater things, because we drop that into our American ideology, and we say, hey, greater things, that means better things, that means faster things, that means nicer things, and, and that we're going to do things way, way better, and we're going to have greater impact, and well, no, no we're kind of disciple-like, in that we're a little bit myopic, and we're like, hey, I think it's all about us, and we're going to do greater things, but, but what it is about is saying, hey, what is it that's going to bring honor to God, what's going to bring glory, what is it that is the greater things, like, it's not about greater power, it's not about greater attention, it's not about greater us, it's about greater God and the transforming language of Jesus Christ. Remember, he, he said greater things, but I think he's talking on the spiritual life because Jesus was all about transformation. Jesus spoke in transforming language. He said, I'm going to bring sight to the blind, I'm going to bring the lost to being found. I'm going to make the dead alive. I'm going to bring the sick to greater health and those who are in prison, I'm going to set free. Jesus performed his transforming work on all kinds of people, the angry Roman guards, the confused tradesmen, the ambitious and savvy businesswomen, the self-righteous religious leaders by the grace of God through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he put the spirit on the inside. He transformed lives. And so we want to think about what, what is greater things in terms of transformed lives by the power of Jesus Christ. So we, we've said, hey, these three things are really going to be important because they come right out of the passage. It's greater reliance on God. It's saying that there has got to be greater spiritual and we'll hold the numeric kind of it with open hands. But, but we, we're going to pray, we're going to worship, we're going to celebrate, and we're going to expectantly anticipate the surprising works of God. So it's about God. It's about missional intentionality. It's saying, you know what? If Jesus' heart was about transformation, if Jesus came to seek and save the lost, and he called us to pattern our lives after him, then we need to be intentional about being missional. And we grab hold of this phrase of each one reach one. And the idea here is that we can't just leave it up to the staff or we can't leave it up to just a few people, but each one of us 
uh, are called to be intentional in our missional approach to our neighbors. And then greater discipleship, greater maturity and humility as we journey together. Uh, we're we're going to develop a clear and compelling kind of discipleship pathway. And the idea is that we train one another, that we spur one another towards raising up disciples who are making disciples who know, follow, serve, and proclaim Jesus Christ. All right, well, we, we talked about the idea of worship last week, and we talked about the idea of, of reliance on God. And we're going to look at the idea this week of family ministry. And in family ministry, it's the idea of passing our faith on to the next generation. And what I want to do is jump into a passage. We're going to end this morning with a Q&A with our family ministries pastor, Christy Becker. And then we're going to spend some time praying. We're in a 21 days of prayer challenge as a church. I don't know if all of you know this, but we have a group of people that on every day between August 7th and August 28th are praying and doing a circle five miles around both campuses. So they're, they're anyway, 21 walks that are covering, I don't know, like 50 miles. So it's, it's just really, we're just praying for our community. We're asking God just to bless. And if you want to be a part of that, go on our website. You can join the 21 day prayer challenge. All right, today's passage is Proverbs chapter 3. If you have your Bible, I encourage you to turn to Proverbs chapter 3. We're going to look at this passage that is written um, to a child. It starts out, my son. Sometimes we skip over that, but it's Proverbs in the first few chapters. It speaks to kids, speaks to kids, speaks to kids. Here it says, my son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart. for, For they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Let them, you know, bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you'll win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. So we could spend a great deal of time just on verses 5 and 6, but I, I kind of want to get the whole flow of Proverbs 3. But it starts this idea that, that the author is writing to a child and says, I I want you to hear what I have to say. And he says, I want to do all I can to promote faith in the next generation. I want to tell you about faith in God. I want to tell you about what it looks like to honor God. And and we are increasingly in a battle for the hearts and minds of our youth. And probably all of us are under this unprecedented and sophisticated attack against all things God, all things Bible, and all things church. Like, 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 this is a time of great conflict and great battle. And let me just say in terms of the things that we see in the culture around us, that we hold tightly to and confidently to God. We hold confidently and tightly to the word of God, but we hold the church (laughs) with a little bit looser hands because our, our version of church, our way of doing church is different than other ways and other versions of doing church. Like, we all need to be about God and faith in Jesus Christ and the reality of the Holy Spirit. We all need to come under and surrender to the Word of God. But our church hasn't got it all figured out. That there are churches around the globe that do things in a very different way, and they're very effective. And so we're going to say, hey, you know what? What we do is the best we can. We're going to do it with excellence. But but we're going to hold tightly to God, and we're going to hold tightly to the Word of God. And we're going to say, how do we do these things? And how do we pass faith on to the next generation? How do we begin to do that and how do we do that well and how do we move because three things one it's a biblical imperative it says you you should pass your faith on to the next generation my son i want you to listen to what i have to say because it's life it's a biblical imperative and the second is a practical reality that we have a ton of kids here we have a ton of kids that are part of both campuses I, i remember when i came to this church about nine years ago um the white bear campus it, the, the idea here was, um, you know, you can come to church, but don't bring your kids because there's just no more room for kids. So we started two services at this campus, not because we needed the space in here, but because we needed the space out there. And, and then about three years ago, we had a kind of a, a large capital campaign and a huge building to, to build more space out there because we have so many kids. And it's an awesome problem it's an awesome challenge and it's an awesome opportunity the same is true at roseville like like we have so many kids that not are not only a part of our church but are around our church and families that we want to come alongside of 
So it's a practical reality. It's a biblical imperative. And then there's this institutional history that says at Calvary Church, for the last 50 years, this has been really important. And, and we've said, hey, we really got to do this well. And for generations, this has been a high priority of saying, how do we come alongside of families? Not only the families that are here, but the families who are not here yet. And so we say, hey, I want to do this well, and we want to do this well, and we got to hold this, and we got to carry this, because this is what God has placed on our heart institutionally as a church. This has got to be a top priority. Imagine if you would, for a minute, there, there's a family that has a, um, like a sacred heirloom, like a like a a vase and so it's passed down generation after generation and then the family that's holding the family vase this family heirloom leaves one evening and they leave the teenagers home alone and they come back and they come to the door and the teenagers meet them at the door and they say hey you know that family heirloom that 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 piece that's been passed down generation after generation well this generation just broke it sorry it's we dropped it it it, it isn't happening so they have this broken vase and it's like that that is not passed on. And, and this is the idea that we pass on to the next generation things that are really important to us, right? Like work ethic, right? I want to make sure my kids have a good work ethic. I want my kids to have great integrity. I want my kids to, to be honest. I think about all the things that I want my kids to do and like and value and those sorts of things. And in our family, it's a little bit weird because it's also like KU basketball and things that are not that important. But, but, but the most important thing is that we pass on faith, Faith in Jesus Christ. Now, here's the reality and the challenge. is that in Scripture, in the stories of the Bible, in the families that we read about there, there isn't a very good track record. Right? Like generations drop the ball. Generations keep failing, not only because parents don't do it, but the kids don't pick it up. And so it's this, this great challenge. Now, there's a couple myths. Dave Keen from Talbot Theological Seminary said there's some myths about passing it on and and he said, I want to undo some myths. So one of the myths is it's, a going to, it's just going to happen by osmosis. Like, like kids are just going to pick it up because they're in our home, because we hang a few things on the wall, or because, because we go to church, we, we take them to church. And, and the, the myth is that it doesn't happen by osmosis. It happens by an intentional effort of parents to pass that on to their children. Because if you just count on osmosis, then kids are going to see you on good days. And to be honest, kids are going to see us when we're not doing very well at all. And if we don't give the context and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, if we don't teach them, as verse 1 says, then there's nothing that they can reflect back on and say, I've been taught. Myth number one is it doesn't happen by osmosis. Number two is that we can just subcontract it, right? We can just let the professionals do it. Take our kids to church and we'll just count on them, the youth pastor, the children's ministry. They'll just... They'll get it done. We've got great volunteers here. So they'll care for the spiritual life of my child. Well, the amount of time they get with that kid versus the time that you as a parent get with that kid is tilted way towards you. So it's a combination. We want to come alongside of you. We want to do all we can to enhance and, and, and celebrate the faith. We want to be other voices that speak the same as your voice. But it, we can't subcontract the character development of our children. It doesn't happen by osmosis. It doesn't happen by professionals. And the third one um, is a myth that kind of gets at the motivation piece of this where we kind of ask the question, um, you know, is it worth it? Is it even working? Like I'm trying and my kid just refuses and we have all these arguments. And, and, and the challenge here is that, yeah, like as kids grow, they they develop and they kind of try out those legs of independence and independent thought and independent action. And that's all good and that's all helpful. But we got to continue to invest. Now, my wife and I have four kids and now we have two daughters-in-law. And, and uh, I, I want to testify one of my greatest joys. One of our greatest joys is seeing our kids live for God. Kids make choices on their own to honor God. Um, it hasn't been easy, and, and I'll be the first to, you know, let's sit down and talk about all my mistakes. Um, but man, we, we just have said, we're, we're not going to subcontract this. We're not going to count on it happening by osmosis. Um, and yes, it's worth it. Is it hard? Yeah. Does it feel at times like we're not making any progress? Absolutely. But I tell you what, this is a biblical imperative. It's, it's absolutely crucial. And, and let me say that, it, that it's not only your own kids. Um, you know, we've had great opportunity to help other kids. We, we've poured into other 
students. And we've walked beside other families. And, and so we want to be a church that not only says, I, I want to do what I can with my family, but I want to make sure that I'm doing something. That they don't forget the teaching, um, that, that, that they see and understand God. So he, he goes on, he says, okay, Proverbs 3, and, and this, I think, just moves into this idea of, okay, if I'm going to be this intentional developer, am I going to be the person that passes faith on? Um, the, the, the Proverbs goes on, and that's why I want to read the whole thing, because it's about the power of God. Um, when you're training a child, it's not about how great I am. It's about the ability of God. It's about the long game of God. It's about the call of God. Um, it depends upon God, not on us. We, we play a role, like we have this really important role in passing faith on but the, the bible again it says you know, these these parents they just kind of dropped the ball judges 210 just kind of sobering verse it says after that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers another generation grew up who knew neither the lord nor what he had done for israel man it's tough and, and god help us that that isn't what happens so parenting keeps us humble we stay uh, we stay humble, we stay on our knees, we, we continue to pray and, and advocate. Um, but verse 7, let's, let's read verse 7. Verse 7 says, do not be wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord and shun evil. And then there's this promise, this will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Don't be, believe the press clippings about yourself. Teach your kids not to believe the press clippings about themselves. Now, another one, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops, then your barns will be filled overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine so it's not only being humble it is being generous it's battling greed and and the things that come in this culture that's all about accumulation the next verse my son do not despise the lord's discipline and do not resent the rebuke because the lord disciplines those he loves and the father the son he delights in and that's a challenge one to live out and it's a challenge to uh, teach a, ch a child. So it's like, don't, don't be wise in my own eyes. Use my stuff for the kingdom of God. It's not all about accumulation. And when the Lord's discipline comes, now, I, I usually don't wear sweatshirts to church, the traditional crowd. You're particularly wondering, why is he wearing a sweatshirt? But this is a cool sweatshirt that has this great logo. I'll turn around, you can see it a little bit bigger, and it's on the screens. Now, I, I look at this because there's bumper stickers all over the Twin Cities. And my question is, what does hecky mean? Now, I don't know what, what hecky means. It doesn't say hecky. It says, he is greater than I. It's a math equation. It comes out of John 3.30. And it's a clothing and lifestyle company in Hawaii. And they began by saying, hey, we want to be about cool clothing, but mostly about Jesus Christ. And we want to base our company on John 3.30 that says, I must decrease, he must increase, Notice he is in all caps, I is lowercase. Notice he is in all caps, <laughs> I is in lowercase. And read this passage with, like, it's, it's not about me. It's all about him. It's not about me. It's all about him. God whose love and compassion is far beyond anything that I can fathom. Psalm 145 says that we commend his works to the next generation. It's all about God. It's not about me. And, and, and so it's saying we want to do all we can to advocate for passing our faith on to the next generation. We want to do all we can to champion this. But it comes from humbling ourselves and saying, I want to, I want to point to God. I want to point to God in my good days. I want to point to God in my bad days. I want to point to God when he disciplines me because he disciplines those he loves. I want to point to God, and I don't want to be wise in my own eyes. I, I want to be generous because kids are watching, and I want to always be on a growth continuum. I want to say, you know what? I need to grow. I remember talking to a 20-year-old young guy who said, you know, my dad is just, he's just arrogant. One time he actually told me, he said, son, you can't teach the teacher. And he said, you know, that's my dad's way of saying, don't you ever tell me what you think I should do again. And it just broke his heart. He's like, I care for my dad. I love my dad. I want to talk to my dad, but my dad doesn't have it all figured out, but his dad was just so arrogant. Frederica Matthews Green says this, ego builds a cardboard fortress that humility must every day tear down. Ego builds a cardboard fortress. Don't live in a cardboard fortress. And teach your kids, don't live in a cardboard fortress. Like, like let humility speak and 
humble ourselves before God and humble yourself, dare I say, before your children. Humble yourself before others and stay on your knees. Pray for your children. Pray for the children that you meet and connect with. Not just that God will protect them and bless them. It's really easy to pray. God, would you protect and bless? But the passage says, you know, I'm going to pray that they would grow in wisdom. That they would understand the discipline of God. And when it comes, that they would be filled with the fullness of Jesus Christ. That they would carry on character and that they would be able to endure the hard days. God, I pray that you bring them good friends and the influencers. That's a thing now. The influences in their life would be ones that propel their faith and character and integrity. You protect them against all those influencers that want to tear that down. I'm going to pray for them that they will know, follow, serve, and proclaim Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray for them that they will have good connections with friends. And yeah, this feels a little weird for kids, but we're going to pray for their spouse. We're going to pray for their children. We're going to pray for their, gener- you know, their grandchildren that someday faith would continue to be commended to the next generation. And then we pray for ourselves and we say, I, I-, I want to know what to say and when to say it. One of the most important questions we can ever teach our kids to ask. Most Valuable question that will carry them through life. The most important question that will fit every situation is what is the wise thing to do? What is the wise thing to do? The the passage goes on, verse 12. It says, blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding. For she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She's more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand and her left hand. There are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways and all her paths are peace. She's a tree of life to those who take hold of her. For those who hold fast will be blessed. What is a wise thing to do? It's it's creating teachable moments where we can can step into our our child's life or maybe as a a youth ministry or a kid's ministry where we just can point to God and say, hey, what's the wise thing to do? It's creating teachable moments where we reflect not only on who God is, but on on our own life and our own story. It's being intentional. Um, It is said in a study by Sticky Faith that it takes five people to impact a kid. So mom and dad, you get one spot. Maybe the youth ministry, kids ministry gets another spot but we need three other adults in your life, in the life of your children to point them to and to, and, and to compel them towards faith in Jesus Christ. So that means we need to be available. We, we need to take a look at not only our own kids, but we look at other kids. And then we're also saying, hey, with our own kids, we got to get them in the lives and in the pathway of other people who know, follow, proclaim Jesus Christ. So, so we look for opportunities for faith. I was, uh, I was kind of rumbling on this idea of teachable moments. And many of you know that my wife and I are right now in a teachable moment. Uh, they diagnosed Becky with breast cancer about two weeks ago. And surgery is tomorrow. And uh, we, we've, we've done a lot of humbling ourselves, like just kind of on our face before God. We have... Um, sought through the the whirlwind right it's like zero to 60 in medical appointments the whirlwind of decision making to make wise decisions what's the wise thing to do what's the wise thing to do we've talked deeply about what's the wise thing to do but um becky is um an amazing woman she's a strong woman and and she said again and again but i just want god to use this I want, I want our kids to be encouraged that they can trust God. I want others to see Jesus. I, I don't know why, and you know, it's lots of tears. And um, but what we thought about Proverbs three, five, and six: trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. I, man, I'm, I'm far beyond my understanding here. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He'll make your path straight. So I, I want to encourage you, um, create teachable moments, take time and risk to, to go beyond your own family structure, to 
help other kids have sticky faith. Um, but when God brings stuff, Joni Erickson Tata, who, who many of you know, had a swimming accident in her teens, and she was uh, paraplegic in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. She has battled cancer twice. Some lessons you only get through pain. And she said, God allows what he hates to accomplish what he loves. God is not about death or disease, divorce or destructive people, but, but sometimes he allows to accomplish what he loves. So we're praying that God will use this. We're praying that God will use the stuff that's in your life. There's a lot going on at Calvary Church, but, but let's let God use that teachable moment to not only encourage one another, but to commend faith to the next generation so they don't grow up not knowing God or the acts, the powerful acts that he has done. I, I really can't think of a better way to finish this than to bring up uh, Christy Becker. Christy, if you'll come up, she's our family ministries pastor. She's responsible for and oversees um, you know, ministry to zero to 18 and their families. Um, Christy is not only... Uh, theologically astute, but very, very practical. Like you live this, you lead it. You, you do this really well. And so, um, Christy, tell us a little bit about how you see in the areas you're responsible for um, us getting to more transformed lives through family ministry. Yeah, it's been it's been so neat going through this process of of um, thinking thinking about a new vision and. Um, kids and students are not an add-on to that. Everything that we're talking about with the vision, the new vision of Calvary Church um, just ties deeply to what happens in kids' ministry. So I just want to give you a few examples of that. Um, as we talk about greater discipleship, we've talked about, um, we've talked about what is the pathway that an individual goes through as they are on their faith journey. And it starts with, for some people, some people are um, not interested in faith. Some people are spiritually curious. Some people are believers. And then there's growth from believer to believers who are being discipled to believers who are making disciples. And we feel like kids and students can fall anywhere on that continuum. And as we move forward, as, with a better understanding of that, we want to become students of our students and, and kind of find out where they are. Um, and then we want to start discipleship from that place so that we can meet them where they're at. And our strategy for this is to build teams of deeply invested volunteers who will commit to um, developing relationships and doing discipleship from that point. Um, we think that when an adult has a small circle of kids or students that they're investing deeply in, knowing um, and discipling, that um, we can see some real um, growth and change. Um, so that's exciting. And then... Um, in terms of reliance on God, we've had a lot of, op we're having some opportunities to rely on God for some big things, for some greater things. We want to reach more kids and more students in our communities of Roseville and White Bear. And so this fall, we're going to be expanding our fusion ministry, our ministry to middle school students to offer programming on Wednesday nights at both campuses, because we know that there are um, spiritually curious teenagers in, in both of our communities, and we want to make a difference in their lives. So this hasn't been entirely easy, and when things are not easy, when there are puzzles that are hard to figure out in terms of space and staffing and schedule, you, when you're in those moments of, of puzzle, you really realize that you need to rely on God. So we've had some opportunities to rely on God, and it's been really cool to be able to hang on to that and say, yeah, part of, this, part of our vision is that we're going we're gonna to dream about great things for the kingdom and great things that only we can do if God shows up and provides. And we, we've seen that. We've seen that. We're starting to see some clarity in how this is all going to work space-wise and schedule-wise and, and with um, staffing. And then finally, missional intentionality. We're excited about that one. Calvary has a ministry called After School Kids. Um, it serves kids in the neighborhood of Falcon Heights at an area school. Um, it provides free after school child care for those who need child care. And it tends to um, serve families who wouldn't normally be at Calvary Church. Um, over 20 years, Calvary's been doing this. And um, it's always been a missional part of Calvary. 
Um, this year, we're relaunching our prayer partner ministry through After School Kids. It was on a little bit of a break during COVID. And each ch child in that program is going to have a Calvary disciple maker who is assigned to them to pray for them, to develop a relationship with them and their family. And we just really want to um, use that as an opportunity to, um, to get in contact with people outside of our walls and develop real relationships with them where we can see um, life change. That's awesome. Those are some really good things. Um, how can we, I mean, there's already some things we can pray about there, but how can we specifically pray for you, pray for your team, um, not only staff, but the volunteer, the, the, probably the largest volunteer team we have here at Calvary, but how, how can we pray for you? Yeah, yeah, well, we just, we, I would just um, ask for your prayers that we would have um, lots of volunteers, leaders who are just passionate about investing deeply and discipling students and that we'll be able to reach more kids and teenagers in our community with the hope of Jesus and that they will respond in, fi in, in faith and put their um, trust in Jesus. Um, and then, you know, it's a changing world. Families are different. Culture is different. And um, for those of us inside the church, it's, it's, there's, there's a bit of a learning curve. So I would just, we're very aware that we need to um, better understand the families in our changing culture so that we can reach this new generation of parents and kids. And so I would ask for your prayers around that as well. That is a, a really good um, ongoing huge prayer. So thank you for that. Would you stand with me? And at Roseville, if you would stand and let's just uh, commit this, this ministry and this team and Christy is the leader um, to, to the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for Christy and I pray in every way that you would bless and protect, but you'd also continue to do your stretching work. Um, pull her in ways that she depends more deeply upon you. And God, I thank you for her visionary leadership to say, how do we do missional intentionality well? How do we teach our kids, students, families to rely upon God? And, and how do we train up? How do we disciple really well? We know that students come from all different places. We know that families come from different places in their faith journey. And so, God, I pray that we would understand, that we would do the work that takes to understand, to learn, um, and that we would adjust as we should so that we can accomplish greater things for Jesus Christ. Lord, we commit Christy to you. We commit the volunteers to you. We commit the staff that is working tirelessly in so many ways, on so many levels. We just pray this in the name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen. Let's sing together. <laughs> continues, I want to encourage you to stop uh, in the atrium today to hear from Melissa Bennett as she shares about a recent impact, uh, month-long experience that she had. And as maybe if you were listening to, as you were listening to, to Pastor Christie, if you're looking for ways to get involved in family ministry or other ways to get involved here at Calvary, I invite you to stop at the spotlight table today after the service.
And then finally, we have 24 people that are being baptized today, professing faith in the Lord Jesus. And I want to invite you to come to, come to Northwestern, University of Northwestern at one o'clock today. So go grab some lunch and then come support all of these people who are making a profession of faith in our Lord Jesus. As you go this week, may that promise from Proverbs 3, 5 ring true in your ears to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Have a great week.